Hi, everybody. My name is Teresa Torres with Product Talk. You can find me online at www.producttalk.org and on Twitter at T Torres. That's T T O R R E S. I work as a product discovery coach, and today I'd like to give you a brief introduction to what product discovery is. Let's go ahead and get started. The term product discovery originates with this concept of dual track development, sometimes referred to as dual track scrum or dual track agile. It's this idea of separating discovery, how we decide what to build from delivery, the act of scaling and building something for production. What's great about this distinction is it allows us to really look at discovery as its own part of product management. How do we make good decisions about what to build next or are we building the right things? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start by describing how most teams work. So let's look at the most common way that teams decide what to build next. This is going to sound familiar to a lot of you. Uh, Most companies, they have some sort of intake or inception process where a list of initiatives are generated. Maybe it comes top down from your senior leadership and they say these are our priorities, build these things. Maybe each product manager is responsible for their own domain. They generate their own list. They prioritize it. Or maybe ideas come from anywhere in the building. I know a lot of companies use sort of idea management software. Anybody can contribute an idea. People vote on them. Maybe even customers are involved. But somehow a list is generated. And then somewhere along the line, uh, as the product manager or as the organization, we have to prioritize that list and decide where to invest. And this is where we get a lot of things like um, prioritization algorithms. Do we take into account business value or ROI and how do we calculate that? Do we look at the value to the customer or how many customer requests are around a certain idea? This is where time to build tends to come in. Now, I'm guessing this does sound familiar. It's how a lot of product managers work. It's how a lot of companies work. And in a a lot of cases, this is how people would actually define product management. How do we manage a list of product features, a list of product ideas, and prioritize and decide what to build next? And this way of working comes with an underlying set of assumptions. Let's take a look at what some of those are. The first is this assumption that we know our customers. So part of the, part of the reason why with this, this method of generating ideas internally and ranking those ideas based on how much customers want them, there's this underlying assumption that we have the knowledge in the building about what will be most relevant to our customers. And a lot of that is tied to the second assumption that we are the experts, that we have enough expertise to generate ideas and to make these prioritization decisions. And finally, as long as we're diligent and and smart about our analysis, there's this underlying assumption that we're probably right. So as long as we're creative and we generate good ideas, as long as we're diligent in our prioritization scheme, We're going to come up with good things to build, and therefore we should just go full steam ahead and build them. Now, these assumptions aren't necessary. They're not, they're not false. And I want to talk a little bit about why they're not false, but I also am going to argue that they're not true and that a lot of teams are moving beyond this model of product discovery for that reason. So let's revisit each one of them. So it is true that you know a lot about your customers, especially if you've been in your industry or been working on your product for a long time. You've built up a lot of domain knowledge about your customers. But where this is false is that all human beings are complex and there's always more about them than we can possibly know. And the nuances of what we know versus what they know is often the realm where products succeed or fail. Right, You've seen this in your own experience with products where you're sold on an idea, it's exactly what you need, you start using it, and it's not really exactly what you need, it falls short, it doesn't meet our expectations. This is often due to that gap between what our customers know about themselves and what we can know about them. So while we do know about our customers, it's not entirely true. We don't always know enough to be able to build good products for them. Same with this second assumption, 
we are experts. We're experts in our technology. We're ex- we have a lot of, again, we have a lot of domain knowledge about our industry. We may even have expertise in product management in this process around generating ideas, around prioritizing ideas. But where our expertise falls short, again, related to this first assumption, is in understanding our customers' needs as well as they do and being able to evaluate how well a solution meets those needs. Our customers are always going to be better at that than we could be. And then finally, this last assumption is where I think there's a a much bigger gap. And that's that if we look at, if we're honest with ourselves and we look at the last hundred things that we built, we probably weren't right most of the time. Now, you might actually be disagreeing with that when you hear this right now because we don't actually do the work to instrument our products and to know what impact they actually had. So it's easy to hand wave and say, oh, it probably worked or it worked well enough. We live in this land of vagary, but as soon as we start to move towards more modern practices around instrumentation and measuring the impact of our product changes, we start to see that we're actually wrong quite often. And so this model is really starting to break down. And as a result, some of the best product teams are starting to work in a new way. So I want to talk about the new way of doing product discovery. And this looks radically different. Rather than sitting around inside the building collecting ideas and assuming that the knowledge is within the building, these teams are going out and they're immersing themselves in their customer's world. They're actively working to develop a deep understanding of their customer, what their needs are, the context in which those needs occur, and through this deep understanding, ideas emerge So they're not sitting in a room saying, hey, what can we build tomorrow? They're going out in the world, they're talking to customers, they're hearing problems, and that's triggering ideas. So ideas emerge from this deep understanding of the customer. And then finally, even when these ideas emerge from that research and from that deep understanding, they still move forward cautiously. They don't move forward full steam ahead. Instead, they say, we need to iteratively test this idea Let's do a little bit, see what happens. If it looks like it's the right path, we'll do a little bit more. And this way of working also has some underlying assumptions, but you're going to see they're very different from the other way. So the first assumption is that even if we have a lot of knowledge about our customer, we still need to actively work to develop empathy and to build out our knowledge of our customer. Remember, our customers are always going to know more about their own needs and their own context than we possibly could. So this needs to be an ongoing, continuous discovery process where we're always trying to close that gap. And this is really related to the second assumption, which is our customers are the experts. They know their needs better than we could, and they're better at evaluating whether our solution is a good fit than we are. So what this means is we need to invite them to co-create with us. And the third assumption is even when we do all this work, even when we engage with our customers on a regular basis, we are going to get the nuances wrong. It can be a fantastic idea. And as we all know, it's the details that determine whether or not the solution is going to work or not. And so rather than charging full steam ahead, we need to slow down in terms of charging ahead and say, we're probably going to be wrong. Let's slice off one piece that we can get out in the world, start to experiment. And as data comes back that says, keep investing, we go ahead and keep investing. This is a very different model than what a lot of teams are doing. And this is what I want to get into today. So let's talk about the two dimensions to modern product discovery. They're going to sound familiar. Uh, The first is we're going to invest in developing a deep understanding of the customer's world. We're going to constantly be working to close that gap between what they know and what we could possibly know. Our goal in doing that is so that ideas emerge from that deep understanding. And then we're going to follow that up with iteratively testing our ideas. So let's start with developing a deep understanding of our customer's world. Now, some of you are probably thinking we already do this today and I would and I'm going to guess for many of you you are to a degree so a lot of companies have invested in user research teams they have customer insights teams more and more teams are conducting customer development interviews 
This is awesome. We have seen huge progress in the adoption of the tools of the trade related to developing a deep understanding of your customer. What I would argue is that we still have a long way to go on the second half of this goal. So our goal with developing a deep understanding of our customer that's grounded in research, it needs to be shared across the team. So it's not just about our, do we have experts in the building who can be the voice of the customer? It's not just about can our user research research team answer specific questions. It's about how do we across our entire development teams, our product managers, our UXers, our data analysts, our business stakeholders have a rich shared understanding of our customer's world that's grounded in research. So what I see happen a lot in practice is people use the tactics, they do interviews, they do observations, they co-create with customers but it's really isolate, isolated in centralized teams or in one role. And the power of having it be shared across the entire team is remember, we want ideas to emerge from this, sh- from this deep understanding. When the deep understanding is shared across the team, everybody can see ideas. Everybody can contribute to idea generation. And we benefit not just from the rich context, but from everybody's experiences. So we do see some teams are getting really good at this. They're getting really good at not just doing the research, but they're getting really good at sharing, building a shared understanding across their entire team and across their entire company. And so we're starting to see some really good artifacts that represent that sharing occur. So one of those is customer journey maps. So a customer journey map is a map that tells a story. I'm a customer, I have a goal, I'm trying to accomplish something. What's the journey that I take going from my present state to achieving my goal. In this case, we're looking at a customer journey map around going to the gym. So I have workout goals. I needed to go to the gym. There's things that interfere. That There's things that make it easy. There's things that make it challenging. Now, what happens when a lot of people start using customer journey maps is somebody in the building sits down and they just create it based on the knowledge in their own head. One thing that I want to encourage you to do is that this should be grounded in research. It's not what do you think, what does your marketing team or your customer success team think the customer journey is? It's how do you synthesize what you learn in your interviews, in your observations, in your co-creation exercises to really understand the journey that your customer is taking from their perspective. So not from your company's perspective, not from your product's perspective, but from your own, from your customer's perspective. How would they describe their journey? The other thing that I see happen is that usually it'll be one or two people in a company that sit down and create the map and then they send it out to everybody else. The challenge with that is it doesn't create a shared understanding. Everybody needs to be involved in the creation of these artifacts. And it's not a one-time activity. These should be living documents. So everybody on your team needs to participate in the research. Your user researchers might be the experts on how to conduct an interview, on how to do observations. But everybody needs to be exposed to that rich context and to what is happening. So invite them to be note takers. Invite them to observe. Share what you're learning with them week over week. Don't just hand them a final artifact. But what's great about the artifacts is it's very visual. You can see it would be very easy for me to get up to speed. It's a good reminder of what I heard when I did participate in an observe and interviews. It allows me to quickly jump in and start to think about the challenge that we're addressing from the customer's perspective. Another artifact is an empathy map. Again, another great tool. It should be grounded in research. Everybody on the team should be participating in that research. And then what this artifact does is it allows you to really quickly, um, at a glance, see when my customer is working through this challenge, what are they seeing? What are they doing? What are they thinking? And what are they feeling? And how can I quickly jump into their head and start to think from that perspective? How can I quickly build empathy? So rather than trying to solve the, per- the, the challenge from my perspective or from your perspective, everybody on the team is aligning around, let's solve the challenge from our customer's perspective. And then finally, another artifact is our customer personas. Now, Again, these need to be grounded in research, not just somebody writes them down. Um, 
because of marketing demographic personas, these often end up being at too high level of a level. There's not a lot of depth. When we're talking about product personas, we want to get at things like what are their goals? What are their motivations? What are they feeling? What are their beliefs? What are their desires? We want this, these to be rich stories about real people. So again, you generate them by doing your interviews, by doing your observations, by doing co-creation exercises. You're trying to synthesize what you learn from your research into simple visuals that can be shared across the team that remind each individual what they heard, what they felt, what they saw while conducting the research. And again, they're living documents. They should be continuously updated. The research should be continuous. Your engineer should be participating in interviews on a regular basis. This is how we develop that really deep understanding of the customer's world, and it's also how we start to close the gap between our own thinking and thinking like a customer would. And remember, our goal in doing all of this is we want to develop a deep understanding so that ideas emerge from that understanding. So we're not just sitting in the building thinking about what what should we build next, but we're out in the world, we're exploring, we're experiencing what what our customers experience, and that's triggering ideas. Now, one quick note before we move on, I shared three artifacts, customer journey maps, empathy maps, and user personas. These are not the only artifacts that come out of developing a deep understanding of the customer. Anything that allows you to quickly visually communicate what you're learning, that allows anybody on the team to quickly remember what it felt like, what they heard, what they saw when doing research, you're trying to help build empathy for the challenges and the pain points that your customers are experiencing. Think about it this way. Think about the last time that you were talking to a friend and maybe they were telling you about a challenge that they were facing. Maybe they had a coworker they were struggling to get along with. Maybe they had a personal problem that they were struggling with. As your friend starts to describe their scenario, what's happening in your head? You're probably thinking about ways that you can help. You're hearing your friend, you're having empathy, you want to help. This is exactly the feeling we want to recreate across your entire team. We want to provide enough context about the customer's world that they feel that pain. They have empathy for the customer and they start to see, they start to have ideas. Their brain starts to generate all sorts of ideas about how can we help. What this does is it really helps to tap into the creativity and the empathy of your entire team. So that's really the goal of this half a discovery. And it's not a do this and then move on to the next step. It's continuous. It's something that you want to build into your daily routine week over week. You're continuing to do more immersion into your customer's world. And the second half of discovery is how do we iteratively test our ideas? So if if our ideas emerge from our deep understanding of the customer, we don't want to just run full steam ahead and build too much. Instead, we want to say, okay, this seems like a good idea. How do we experiment and make sure that it is a good idea? And our goal with this half is to really evaluate whether or not an idea is worth pursuing. Now, a lot of people hear this and they think, I already do this. We A-B test. We build things. We A-B test when we, re- when we release it, it only goes to a fraction of our audience and we only roll it out to everybody if it performs well. That's great. It's better than doing nothing, but there's some challenges with that model. First of all, I know very few teams that actually roll it back when it doesn't perform well. You've invested in it, you built it, you spent money on it, you want to keep it. And it's very hard to make the decision to pull the plug. The second problem is that you've done all of the work to launch the product before you learn that it didn't work. It's a very expensive way to learn. I prefer to get teams learning as quickly as possible that their idea is not going to work so they can move on to the next idea and find the one that will. The only way to do that quickly without spending a lot of money on development is to take your ideas, ask the question, if this I- what has to be true for this idea to work? It's going to help you uncover your underlying assumptions. Every idea has a whole set of assumptions that have to be true for that idea to be successful. And this is a step that's very easy to talk about. It's very challenging to do in practice. It's hard to see our own thinking. So it takes practice 
to really start to see why do we think this idea is good, what has to be true in order for it to work. The next step, once we have a list of assumptions, is to say, is to look around and say, what evidence do we have that either supports or that is either in support of or against this assumption? And it's really important to do both, to not just look for evidence that supports your assumptions, but to also look for evidence that might refute your assumptions. And when I say evidence, it could be anything from past experiments that you've run things you've learned in your customer interviews. It could be win-loss analysis from your sales team. It could be customer requests. You're just looking around your, your, your universe and saying, what do we know that either supports this assumption or that works against this assumption? And then based on that inventory of existing evidence, you want to look at which of these assumptions that, that, need, that has to be true for this idea to work Which of them seems riskiest? And then for the riskiest assumptions, you want to go ahead and turn them into formal hypotheses and run experiments. What your experiments allow you to do is to collect further evidence. You're trying to de-risk a risky assumption. And based based on the evidence that you collect through those experiments, you can now make a judgment call. You should now have a pretty exhaustive inventory of your assumptions that have to be true and the evidence that supports or refutes them. And you basically need to decide, is this idea worth pursuing? How many of the assumptions are true? How many of them need to be iterated on or evolved? And oftentimes it's not a go or no go decision. It's let's modify the idea based on what we're learning. And at some point you have enough evidence that you say, okay, let's go ahead and iteratively invest in this idea. And this is where we're ready to go into an agile delivery method. Other times we look at it and we say, you know what? The evidence just doesn't support it. We need to jump to the next idea. Now, the first or second time that you go through this loop, it's going to feel really tedious and really slow. For every idea, you might generate a dozen assumptions. You might not have any evidence. Maybe you don't run experiments. Maybe you have little experience talking to customers. Maybe your sales team has never done a win-loss analysis. And all of your assumptions are strongly held beliefs, but there's not a lot of data behind them. In this case, your first couple times through the loop are going to feel really slow. You're going to have to run six, seven, eight experiments for every idea, and it's going to feel like you're never going to ship a product again. That problem goes away very quickly. And the reason why is because most of your ideas share underlying assumptions. So once you've been through this loop the first time, you've now ran a bunch of experiments. You're starting to build evidence for some of your assumptions. The next time you go through the loop, you're going to do your inventory of what evidence you have for your assumptions, and you're going to have a lot more evidence, which means you're going to have to run fewer experiments. So every iteration, you're going to go faster and faster through the loop. Basically, every experiment that you run is collecting evidence to support or refute an assumption. And when we support our assumptions, we start to look at, I like to use the analogy of, we're collecting building blocks. We're starting to learn more things that are true about our business or true about our customer base. And as we collect building blocks, as we run experiments, we collect more and more building blocks. And the more that we experiment and the more that we iteratively test our ideas, the more building blocks we collect. And eventually we can start to look around at all the building blocks we've collected and ask ourselves, what can we build based on what we know? Again, our ideas start to emerge from our customer context, from our experimentation, rather than just sitting in a room and having our ideas emerge from a set of strongly held beliefs or assumptions that don't have any evidence behind them. And this, when we get to this point where we have a lot of building blocks, we have a lot of, de- we're, we have ongoing research, we're constantly learning about our customers, we start to get this virtuous cycle where ideas emerge from our deep understanding, those ideas get iteratively tested, we start to learn more about which assumptions are true and which are not, that feeds back into our deep understanding of our customer, which makes our ideas even better and better. Now, I work as a product discovery coach and oftentimes what I see is that companies that are on their journey of adopting these new practices, they tend to be really good at one side or the other. So there are companies that are really good at qualitative research. They have strong user research teams. Maybe they've had training in design thinking and they're building 
really rich customer journeys. They're building really rich empathy maps. They have really rich user personas. But more often than not, it's not connected to the product development teams. The product managers, the engineers, maybe the UXers, they're not using it week over week. It's not where ideas aren't emerging from the con- deep context. So the product managers or the business is still just generating ideas from their own perspective. So all this great research is going on, but the business isn't benefiting from it. It's not leading, to, it's not generating new ideas for the business. The other thing that I see happen is companies tend to be really good at this other side. They're really good at iteratively testing their ideas. Companies that are strong in the lean startup approach tend to be very good at iteratively testing their ideas but they're not starting with a deep understanding of the customer, which means most of their ideas are wild guesses. So they're churning through a lot of ideas before they find something that's compelling or they're settling for mediocre ideas. So one of the things I try to really encourage teams to do is to think about how do you make sure you're doing activities on both dimensions? You're constantly working on developing a deep understanding of your customer. You're constantly developing, iteratively testing your ideas and that you maintain the link between the two so that ideas are emerging from your deep understanding of the customer and that as you iteratively test, it's feeding back into that deep understanding and that you don't sever those links. All right, I hope that gives you a brief taste of what I think modern product discovery looks like. Uh, Thank you for taking the time to watch. If you have questions or if you have feedback, I'd love to hear from you. Again, I'm easy to find online at producttalk.org and on Twitter at T